in Zechariah chapter 3. I was thinking of the second verse, but when I looked at the second verse, I noticed that the first verse goes with it, so I'll read Zechariah 3, 1 and 2, maybe a little bit more. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now here's Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, and you'd like to think that Satan wouldn't be anywhere around. That's what you'd like to think. The person standing before the angel of the Lord, you'd like to think that that's a holy place, sacred place, and that Satan wouldn't be there. But here is Satan standing right at the right hand of Joshua to resist him. In fact, Satan is doing the very thing that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to resist Satan, and there's Satan standing there to resist Joshua. And the second verse is the one that I was really looking for when Terry was sharing about a little fire, a little smoke. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? That was what I was looking for. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Every brand that is plucked out of the fire, Satan is there from time to time standing at their right hand. He was standing at his right hand resisting him. I remember after Jesus was tempted in the wilderness that it said in the Amplified Version of the Bible that Satan uh, left him for a while awaiting a more opportune time to come and tempt him. And that Satan does the same thing with us. He looks for those opportune times. What we would like to have as the time for temptation would be uh, at a time when we're supposedly all ready for him, but that's not the time that he's looking for. He's looking for the most opportune time, and that's the way he was with Jesus. If he does that with Jesus, what does he do with us? If he is looking for a more opportune time to tempt the Son of God when he was on this earth, how much more is he looking for an opportune time to tempt us? And just meditating on that first verse in my mind, I remember... Brother Helm saying that he and Reverend Paul Hill were in the midst of praising the Lord, and they were praising the Lord as much as they possibly could with all that they had, and right in the midst of praising the Lord, Satan was right there, right in the midst of that, telling them that they weren't even saved. Satan was telling them they weren't saved, and they were praising Jesus. Think of that. I, I really can't comprehend it, except that it says here that Joshua was standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan was standing in his right hand to resist him at the same time, at the very same time. So it's amazing to me how that we can be right in the midst of serving God with all our heart and doing the best that we can, and Satan is right there attacking and accusing. I would think that it would be easy for us to listen to what Satan has to say and to believe what he is saying when he's saying, you're not even saved. But if a person is really saved, Satan will say to them, you're not saved. Now, if you're not saved, Satan won't say that to you. He doesn't have to say that. But if you're really going with God, Satan's a liar. He is the father of lies. We all remember that. So when Satan is lying to us and telling us that we aren't saved, we can rest assured that that's a wonderful report. It's a wonderful report, and we're glad to hear that we really are saved, by God's grace only. Mm -hmm. We know it's by God's grace only, but Satan doesn't want us to believe it's by anything or anyone. Because every person that has been converted is a brand plucked out of the fire. I don't know all that this fire is talking about, but I know there's an eternal fire that we can be plucked out of, we can be saved from. We're a brand plucked out of it. We can still be on fire. 
but it reminds me of a story of a man that is an apostle. He was an apostle. He was about five years of age or so at the time that this was happening in the country of England. He was one of the younger children. There were about 19 children in the family. The family at that time, I do not know if it had 19 children, but a fire came on this house because a man was serving God. Sam Wesley believed in serving God with all his heart and what he preached that people didn't like, and it stirred up the community in such a way that their house got set on fire. And when their house was set on fire, they tried their best to get out of the home, and they thought everyone was out, and they were counting all the children to make certain they had a large family. It'd be easy to miss one. And they found that one was missed. John Wesley was still left inside the home. And the home was pretty much enmeshed in flames. It looked like that it was going to go completely. That's what it looked like. It seemed like it would at any time. I don't know who the men were or women that started this fire, but I do know that some volunteers decided to make a human ladder. For they saw John Wesley in one of the upper windows looking out. He couldn't go down the stairway because it was engulfed in flames. And to jump, I don't know what that would mean. But some men got on top of one another's shoulders and they made a human ladder. And they went, went to the window where John Wesley was. And they reached just high enough, just soon enough, to pluck the brand from the fire. For that's what John Wesley always called himself, a brand plucked from the fire. Now that was a literal fire, but we're all brands plucked from the fire, uh, spiritually speaking. In fact, this whole uh, chapter 3 is a, is a type of Joshua in the church. It says it's not really uh, Joshua necessarily. It's a type, it says here. He was plucked from the fire, and just as he was plucked from the fire, the house gave through and just crashed to the bottom. It was just within seconds. I think it was within the same second that they plucked him from the window that the house fell down, and he would have been, just think of that, he would have died. One of the two men that was used, I was thinking of this also when we were singing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, because that was written by Charles Wesley, his brother. These two men were used to save England from revolution, which is another kind of fire, and yet uh, God's timing is always on time. <laughs> His timing is always on time. It looked like this little boy was going to be uh, destroyed. All the family saved but him. It looked like it. It seemed like it. And there are times when it looks like we're just about ready to go under ourselves. But I'm so thankful for the grace of God and the love of Jesus. I'm so thankful that he plucks us out of the fire, out of the fire of temptation. He plucks us out of the fire of temptation because the fire of temptation comes upon us and, and we may be standing before the angel of the Lord, but here's, here's Satan right at our right hand. Right at our right hand. But the Lord, the Lord said unto Satan, see Jesus prayed for Peter that the devil would not be able to sift him. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us now. And it says, The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Sometimes we're in the fire of affliction, and in the same kind of fire of the fire of affliction, Jesus can pluck us out of that fire as well. I just thought of that when Terry was sharing about the fire. When we read this, and when we uh, sang the song, I was reading the song too about love divine, all loves excelling, and Charles Wesley. And this this scripture came to me sometime during the night. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? I really haven't had a message uh, all week, and I never had a message all day. But um, shortly before I came. Uh, I was looking on scriptures on, on uh, God's mercy. He has mercy toward us. And then I came across a message that God uh, was dealing with me on in the past. And it's about Mephibosheth. 
and Mephibosheth was a person who was lame. And that was just before he came over, and I feel like I, uh, I'm going to need Jesus to help me. But I was glad about the opening scripture, I'll tell you that, because the opening scripture, I just want to read that again. Then Philip went down, this is Acts chapter 8, verse 5, 6, and 7. Acts 8, 5, 6, and 7. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And it was verse 7 that you read from, from Acts 8 that was helping me because Mephibosheth was lame. <laughs> it was helping me. And verse 7 says, For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. Now that verse really helped me, that were lame, were healed. Because when I was looking, I have a, a Thompson's Chain Reference Bible, and when I was looking at mercy and mercifulness, I was studying about mercy, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness and to children's children. I happened to notice that up above was Mephibosheth. It starts with an M too. And I had read about Mephibosheth before, and Mephibosheth is not an easy word to pronounce, but there's a lot in his life. A lot in his life because he was lame, and he got his lameness under the king's table. He got his lameness under the king's table. And this takes us back to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel, in the fourth chapter, 2 Samuel 4. You may want to look with me as to how Mephibosheth got his lameness what he did with his lameness after he got it, and how, how this lameness can really be applied to our own personal lives, because every person, before they meet Jesus, we're lame. We're, we're lame. And after we meet Jesus, we've got to bring all of our lameness to him and get it under his table so that it'll be covered up, so that when we're looking at one another, we're not seeing each other's faults, because our lameness, our faults are under the table and they're covered. You see, they're covered. And Mephibosheth got his, got his lameness covered. And when our lameness is covered, we're not seeing each other's faults. And we can't even see our own faults. All we can see is the king who's spreading a table for us to give us a feast. So this is the thought that I want to share with you. And it starts in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. This is where his lameness came. I'd like to point out, just before I read this verse right here and some references with it, that our lameness usually is a result of our own personal hastiness. Being in a big hurry to do something in self will cause us to become lame in some area of our lives. Our own hastiness, our own hurriness, our own being in, a, in an effort to try to uh, proceed in the self and in the flesh and going too fast will cause us to become lame. We are moving ahead so fast. Uh, you know, when a person becomes a Christian, they want to know everything immediately. They, they're not willing to wait on God and let Him teach them because uh, the flesh wants to rush ahead and just learn and know everything quickly, very quickly. But before we became a Christian, it was even worse. It was worse at that point because in all of our hastiness to do what self, self has a desire over here and it rushes over here to get it and it receives lameness. Self has a desire over here, a certain desire, a certain pleasure of life and rushes over to receive it and lameness comes into the body. Lameness is a thing that only Jesus can take care of. And here it was here was a hasty situation that caused lameness. Second Samuel four four and Jonathan, Saul's son. Now this is kind of good to know that Mephibosheth was Saul's son. I mean was Jonathan's son. Was Jonathan's son. It's important to know that David loved Jonathan, and there's been a lot about love here today. And you all remember that David and Jonathan loved each other. It seems like I remember a scripture where David and Jonathan loved each other more than even a man loves his wife. Seems like I remember a scripture like that. Do you recall one like that? Seems like I recall that their love was uh, was a was a tremendous love they had for one another here on this earth. It had to be of God. It had to be of God. And now Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son. He's Jonathan's son. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. 
Now, he was very young, just five years of age. Most of the things that are in our lives start when we're little, and they just work, and if they're not taken out of us when we're little, we have our lameness when we're old. Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, was lame when he was old because of something that happened to him when he was five years of age. Think of it. Five years of age, and when he's an older person, and when his uh, father is gone, and Saul is not king anymore, and David is king, the lameness he received when he was five years of age is with him, and had been with him all of his life, from the age of five clear up. Many of the things that we are lame with today came to us when we were very young and stayed with us. It's pretty serious to keep away from all things that would cause lameness when we're little because it'll stay with us. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass that she made haste to flee. See, she was in a big hurry now. Well, it was a dangerous place, wasn't it? And he fell, and he became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. He became lame. What a tragedy. At the age of five, he became lame at such a young age, and that lameness stayed with him for the rest of his life. I tell you, though, when he got his feet under the table, that was a wonderful place to be. When he got his lameness under the king's table, that's, that's down the road a ways, but I'm glad that the king's table was out there and that he could get his feet under the king's table and that you couldn't see his lameness anymore. Yeah, I'm glad that that's out before us. We haven't gotten to it in the scriptures yet, but I just want to bring it before us to show that even though we may have lameness that came to us when we were young, there's, a, there's hope for us. The love of God wants to get all of our lameness under his table. He has a table for us. And I believe chapter 9, verse 6 in my chain reference here is the next place that we'll be looking. It says in my Thompson chain reference Bible that Mephibosheth is a type of the redeemed sinner. I can see that every person is lame and that this is our sinful condition and that Mephibosheth, he belonged to a royal line. He was a member of the royal family. Amen. But he was lame. <laughs> he was lame, but he was a member of the royal family. Every person. God wants to claim every person as his son or daughter. He wants to claim. We all have the privilege of being a member of the royal line. We all have this privilege. But he was crippled by a fall. And in Samuel, 2 Samuel 9, I believe uh, it was 6, verse 6 there. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face. Could I go back and read from the first verse? Because this is the most important chapter dealing with Mephibosheth, this whole chapter. So I'm going to start at verse 1 of chapter 9. And David said, he is the king now, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? He loved Jonathan so much. And when God's love is in someone for another person, that love will help you to take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. God's love will help you to take care of other people or other situations. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. Isn't it something that there was a servant there? Because here was a servant who was going to help them to know that there was a need. <laughs> there was somebody out here, and he was lame, and he needed help. Amen. He needed help. If somebody's lame, they've got to be carried around. They have to, well, they have to stay inside quite a bit. They can't get out much. But Ziba knew about it, even though Mephibosheth couldn't get out. Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, verse 3 we're in, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. You know, I, I'd like to continue to review the fact that if we have any lameness, <laughs> that God knows about it. <laughs> and he's going to be looking for servants to help to bring us in to get this lameness taken care of. If we have any lameness, Jesus wants to do something about our lameness. He, he has the ability. He has the strength. For the hand of the Lord is mighty, Amen. mighty to deliver. And I'm thankful for deliverance from evil. In verse 4, And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba, who is the servant, remember, said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, Mephibosheth fell on his face and did reverence. 
And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. <laughs> Yeah, I really like that. <laughs> He's going to be able to eat bread at the king's table continually. Here's a lame man. Lame since he was five years of age. Why? Well, where was he? He was in the house. He was in the house. He was probably in there most all the time. Couldn't get out. And now a person who was in the house, who was unable to go around, who could if he's not careful and... Many of us would become discouraged and we would feel like we've been rejected and feel like we've been left out. Now he's in the king's house. Amen. Kind of afraid at the beginning. You see, when you come up to the king's yeah, house, yeah. my, I mean, it's fear and trembling if we really know where we are. I wish I would know where I am because it would bring fear into my heart that would be of God. But he's going to be able to eat bread at the table continually. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? It's no wonder that God wanted to help him. <laughs> he thought he was a dead dog. You know, that he had humility. He, he had to have humility. He had to have humility. The reason God was able to do something for Mephibosheth is because he didn't feel worthy of having anything done for him. He felt he was just but a dead dog. Well, that's even worse than being lame, it sounds like. A dead dog can't even move at all. A lame person can look around a little, but he felt that he was just a dead dog. Why, why should you do something wonderful for me? I'm just a dead dog. It's not easy to admit to being just a dead dog. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Well, he got more than just food at the table, more than just being able to eat bread continually. Now he's got an inheritance. <laughs> You're going to have an inheritance when you get your feet under the king's table. Verse 10, Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread all the way at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants, and all of them were going to work for Mephibosheth. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Fifteen sons and twenty servants, and they were going to be out there working to prepare bread and get it all ready for Mephibosheth. He was lame. But if we get our lame feet under the king's table, the king will take care of us. He'll have servants and sons. They'll be out there. They'll be gathering in the bread. They'll be gathering in the help. I tell you, it's wonderful what the king will do for us if we bring our lameness to him. If we could get our lameness under his table, he'll have servants and sons out there taking care of us. We think that we might have financial needs and physical needs and spiritual needs and all kinds of needs. Just get your, your lameness under the king's table and he'll have sons and servants out there taking care of all those needs. He'll take care of them. He has the sons and he has the servants. Now that's a lot of sons and a lot of servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. I tell you, the job's going to get done because we have an obedient servant here. We've got someone who's willing to take what he has and to use it. He has 15 sons and 20 servants, and he's going to use all of them to take care of this job. I'm going to, I'm going to do all that you commanded. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Now, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> he's lame, <laughs> but he's going to be able to eat as one of the king's sons. Not somebody else's sons, but as one of King David's sons. We can come with our lameness, get it under the king's table, and be as one of Jesus' very own sons. Amen. One of Jesus' very own daughters. Well, we may have lameness in this area of our life, and we feel like, well, I, I don't even believe I should even come to church. I don't believe I should come. Well, just bring your lameness and get it under the table. Amen. I tell you, Jesus loves you. Amen. He loves me more than I know. If I only knew how much he loved me, we'd probably resist the devil more, wouldn't we? I would hope so. But it's certainly wonderful how that he's going to be able to be one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. Now, think of that. Think of that. 
all that dwelt in the house of Ziba, and we remember there were fifteen sons and twenty servants, all of them became servants unto Mephibosheth. All of them. All of them. Verse 13 is so wonderful because we see that here is Mephibosheth. He's dwelling in Jerusalem, the holy city. Why God gives us the privilege of being able to dwell in his holy city, being able to dwell among his people, to be one of his sons. And it's only because that we're eating continually at the king's table. I tell you, your lameness shows up when you're walking to somebody else's table other than Jesus' table. Your lameness is visible to others, and your lameness is visible to yourself because you're not able to go so well. It's a stumbling walk while you're falling most all the time. You have to be carried along. But when you're at the king's table, no one can tell. <laughs> they can't tell that you used to have lameness. They can't tell that you had this thing in your life. Jesus is taking it out. You're feeding at his table. He's giving you bread of life, and that bread of life is taking care of all the death. You know, there are things that need to die in us. For he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Here was a person who was lame on both his feet. He, he came with both his feet, got them both under the table. Just think, the, his lameness is covered. And all of our sins can be covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen. I tell you, that was a table that was big. It was a big table. It covered all the lameness, covered every bit of it. I don't know how many people sat at the king's table, but every person that the king wanted to be there was there if he obeyed. If he obeyed, why, Mephibosheth could have felt like, here, I'm lame. <laughs> I'm lame. And I'm not really a member or a part of the family of David, and I don't believe I'll go. But somehow he got there. Somehow he decided to come. He was invited. He could have refused. He could have. Don't you think he had an excuse? If you were lame in both feet, you had a good excuse for not going out of the house and for not going to the king's house. You wouldn't want the king to see your lameness. Well, you're lame. Why, my, the king would want, you know, big, strong, strapping young men coming into his presence, wouldn't he? There might be a few things that would come to your mind. He had to deny all physical things. He had to deny every physical thing that the enemy might have thrown at him, and he denied it all and came to the king in his condition and admitted to being a dead dog, and he was able to sit at the table. He was able to sit at the table... And his lameness could be seen no Amen. more. They couldn't see his lameness anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just wish that today that we could bring our lameness to Jesus and get it under his table. You see, his table is big enough to cover our lameness. And the king doesn't see our lameness anymore. His servants do not see our lameness anymore. And when our lameness is under the table, we can't even see it. <laughs> All we can see is the king and his sons, and we're rejoicing in the brothers and sisters in Jesus, and our lameness is covered up. It's covered up because we're eating at the table spread by God and his son continually. As long as it's continually, we'll never notice our lameness again. But if we get our eyes on our lameness, oh, I tell you, we get discouraged. We think, oh, my, look at my lameness. I'm so lame, I don't believe I can make it. Why, other people, they can get up and they can go and come, and but my lameness, I don't believe I can make it. Well, we've gotten out from underneath the king's table. Whenever we start to look at ourselves, we've gotten out from underneath the king's table. Because as long as we stay under there, we cannot see our own lameness. I just can't get away from that because it's so wonderful. I'm glad you had that opening scripture because I was so weak that I, I don't know if I could have pressed through, but my heart was working within me, but when he read about, and they that were lame were healed, oh, that helped me, over there in Acts. That was over in Acts, right at the beginning. And I was so weak, and even though my heart was starting to deal within me, you said you wanted to be faithful, I was so weak, and I didn't feel like that I could come up and share about that, but I'm so thankful that Mephibosheth pressed through. He pressed through. And by God's grace, he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Yeah. Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you